Hello, my name is Brendan O'Connell. I'm a grassroots member of the West Roxby Rodhill chapter of Massachusetts Citizens for Life, which was started over 30 years ago by fellow Bostonians, Margaret O'Hara and Claire Donahoe. Our chapter believes that this television show named Life Matters is vitally important for all Bostonians, whether you're residents, folks who work in Boston, teenagers, college students, politicians, or whomever. Today's television program examines once again the evolving contentious and controversial topic of embryonic stem cell research from a biological and moral perspective. In July of 2006, three bills were voted in the United States Congress regarding embryonic stem cell research. Proponents for embryonic stem cell research put forth arguments for your federal tax dollars to be used to clone and kill human beings uh, at the embryonic stage of life. Today's guest will address these arguments from both a biological and a moral viewpoint. Moreover, he will discuss a recent article that ap appeared in Nature magazine from a Worcester, Massachusetts firm called Advanced Cell Technologies. I think you'll find today's show to be unique, informative, content-rich, truthful, and thought-provoking. Today's guest was first an embryo and then later born in November of 1968 in the city of Manila in the Philippines. In May of 1989, he graduated summa cum laude with a bachelor's degree in engineering with an emphasis in bioengineering from the University of Pennsylvania. He also matriculated across the Charles River at Mass Institute of, Massachusetts Institute of Technology where he received a PhD in biology in 1996. He was a fellow at the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research at the University College London in London, England. From a moral perspective, he has a master's in divinity and a licentiate in sacred theology in moral theology from the Dominican House of Studies in Washington, D.C. He was ordained a Dominican priest in May of 2004. And folks, that's the abridged version of his curriculum vitae. Uh, welcome to our guest, Reverend Dr. Uh, Nicanor Ostriaco. Thank you. Nice to have you today. Thank you very much, Brendan. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to read uh, the mission statement of Massachusetts Citizens for Life. In recognition of the fact that each human being is a continuum from conception to natural death, the mission of Massachusetts Citizens for Life, Inc. is to promote respect for human life and to defend the right to life of all human beings born and Preborn, We will influence public policy at the local, state, and national levels through comprehensive educational, legislative, political, and charitable activities. Well, Father Nick, um, uh, one of the themes of this TV show is to highlight the broad mosaic of the Right to Life movement. How did your journey evolve to where you're sitting here today talking to me? Well, I've been Catholic all my life, um, but I didn't really take it seriously. I ended up going to MIT to do my PhD in molecular biology. I wanted to be a cancer biologist. Mm -hmm. And I was really introduced to a deeper appreciation of my Catholic faith there when I joined the Catholic Fellowship of MIT, a group of 35 to 50 students, undergraduates and graduate students who took the gospel seriously. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had something that I didn't have, and that was joy. And so they brought me in. They got me to start to pray, to read about my faith. And I ended up meeting the Lord himself. I met him on um, the 7th of May in 1996, and it changed my life. Wow. And I realized that he loved me it, uh, and that I wanted to spend the rest of my life basically responding to him and preaching his love to a world that doesn't know it. So I entered uh -huh. the Dominican order in 1997, studied moral theology, was ordained to the priesthood two years ago. My superiors have now sent me back to Providence College where I'm an assistant professor of biology, as well as an instructor in theology. So that's an abbreviated form wow. of how the Lord called me to this life. Wow, that's quite something. Well, now, for our guest today, uh, we're going to be looking at some of the recent legislation that was uh, uh, voted upon in Washington, D.C., in the United States Congress. And I'd like to address first the uh, it, what's called H.R. 810, the Taxpayer Funding of Human Embryo Experimentation. Uh, Father Nick, could you comment on that from a biological standpoint and a moral standpoint? Sure. Um, in August of 2001, 
President Bush sign an executive order limiting the use of federal funds to stem cells, embryonic stem cells that uh, were created prior to the date of his signing. This bill, had it passed, would have expanded federal funding for stem cells that were isolated from the destruction of human embryos. It was passed by both the House and the Senate, but was vetoed by the President. In fact, it was his first and only veto uh, in his entire six years uh, as President of the United States. Uh-huh. And um, why, why did he, uh, why was it such a um, contentious bill? It was contentious primarily because there were two sides, and both sides were arguing for the necessity of using embryonic stem cells. One side, those, the proponents of the bill, argued that embryonic stem cell research was absolutely necessary for the discovery of new cures for, the, for chronic and debilitating diseases. As opponents of the bill pointed out, however, much of the progress that has been made with stem cells has appeared using adult stem cell work rather than the embryonic stem cells. And as the president properly articulated, our society has to draw a moral line. And there, we can never justify creating, destroying human beings, even embryonic human beings, for the, to, to help others. And so he argued properly so that the government should fund research that will advance cures, but not to the detriment of the weakest of the weak. I see. Well, a lot of the proponents of embryonic stem cell research said, well, they're just frozen embryo embryos and they're just going to be thrown in the trash. Well, what do you have to say to that? Well, f first of all, I think it's, we have to make, very, make it very clear that embryonic stem cell, embryonic human beings are human beings, uh, regardless of whether or not they're going to be discarded or disused. A few summers ago, I served as a chaplain at Memorial Sloan Kettering Hospital in New York. And on the ninth floor of this great and amazing cancer hospital, some have said the best cancer hospital in the world, you have a floor of pediatric patients, young kids, boys and girls, who are sick. They're sick, most of whom unfortunately will die. But simply because they are about to die does not justify us going in and killing them in any way to, say, remove any of their cells in order to provide potential cures for other people. That analogy, that moral argument, carries over to embryonic human beings as well. We, we can't justify taking embryos, even embryos that are imminently dying, embryos that will die within a few days, and say that we will kill them simply in order to use their cells for biological research. It would be, it, to do that would, to, would be to cross a line where we would end up instrument, we would, we, we would make instruments out of people. And I think most of us know that, that that's just something morally repugnant about that. Mm -hmm. And would, now my understanding is that a, an embryo that's frozen can last many, many years. Are you saying in a Petri dish at room temperature they would die shortly thereafter? Well, if, so yes, you're correct in saying that an embryo that is basically frozen down in liquid nitrogen has a very extended viability time, mm -hmm. uh, simply because it's frozen. But if the embryo is thawed, then the embryo eventually will die, simply because uh, it does not have all the nutrients it needs in order for it to grow. Mm -hmm. I see. Well, let's move on and um, talk about uh, another bill uh, th that um, came up in July of 2006, and that was the Fetus Farming Prohibition Act of 2006. That was uh, Senate Bill 3501. Uh, what, uh, what are your thoughts on that? So that bill was sponsored primarily by Senator Brownbeck of Kansas. Mm -hmm. And he was concerned that scientists in the future would try to basically f uh, create fetuses primarily to get tissues and organs that would be eventually used for for biomedical research. So he crafted this bill, which passed unanimously in the Senate and unanimously in the House and signed into law by the President, prohibiting scientists from doing that, from, from, from using fetal tissue that had primarily been created for research purposes. Again, 
the moral line there is that we cannot instrumentalize human beings, even if that instrumental that that using of inst of, of human beings will lead to medical progress. So, uh, give me an example of what would be fetus farming. Then, I mean, what would they? Uh, what, what are they? What are people trying to get out of a fetus that they would use, say, an adult? Well, so for example, um, currently there are efforts to obtain fetal brain cells in order to inject them into Parkinson's patients in the hopes that these fetal brain cells will reverse or cure the Parkinson's patients. None of these experiments have been successful. These cells have been primarily been isolated from aborted fetuses or miscarried fetuses. The, the danger is that we would actually get to the point where scientists would actually make fetuses precisely to obtain cells in order to try to do these type of experiments. I see, to, uh, to supposedly save an adult or... A, or cure an adult cure with an some adult chronic out, or debilitating out beyond disease. the womb, after, That's after birth, basically. Uh -huh. I see. And um, uh, is there... Is this going on in other countries? No, I, I, I do not think that uh, there's any clear evidence that fetal farming per se is being done anywhere. However, people, scientists and others have written about the possibility of utilizing this avenue of research and I think that this forward-looking bill was crafted, eventually passed and signed into law to prevent that from happening. I see. Well now, there was a third bill that was uh, voted on called the Alternative Pluripotent Stem Cell Therapies Enhancement Act. That was uh, S-2754. What was that all about biologically and then also morally? What, uh... Well, that was a significant bill because it was, in a, that it was a bill that was crafted to try to move us as a society beyond the moral impasse that we find ourselves in. With embryonic? With embryonic mean? stem cells. Okay. I think it's, it's important to make clear that those of us who are opposed to destructive embryo research are not opposed to embryonic stem cell research as long as, the, as these embryonic stem cells, these pluripotent stem cells, these cells that are able to give rise to, to 200 or so different cell types are obtained in a morally, uh, a, a morally licit way without the destruction of human embryos. And so in it, last year, 2005, the President's Council on Bioethics proposed several alternatives, different biological approaches to try to identify these very special embryonic stem cells without creating or destroying human embryos. And this bill, which has currently not yet been passed and signed into law, if this bill passes, will encourage the National Institutes of Health, the federal government, to provide funds for scientists who are trying to identify other ways of obtaining these cells without destroying human embryos. Well, are there ways to date now, currently, where you can have embryonic stem cell research and not destroy the human embryo? No, at this point, the only source for embryonic stem cells is through the destruction of a five-day human embryo, what's called a blastocyst. But there are ver several very viable approaches that are being explored throughout this country, as well as in Japan, which, uh, and which are trying to identify uh, alternatives to getting these cells without destroying embryos. Uh-huh, uh -huh. very interesting. Well, uh, now I, um, I noticed uh, a lot of, uh, well, there was a lot of uh, hoopla and pablum uh, uh, with the political aspects up on Capitol Hill, as you well might surmise. Um, what, what um, there, for instance, there was an article uh, in Science Magazine uh, that uh, addressed uh, the issue of uh, embryonic versus adult stem cell research. Could you... Talk about that a little bit. Yes. Um, there was a controversial letter to the editor that was published in, in the journal Science, a very distinguished journal that's published here in the United States, that criticized the work of David Prentice, a biologist himself, mm -hmm. who is also a member of the staff of the Family Research Council in Washington. Okay. And Dr. Prentice pointed out in his numerous talks before different legislative bodies that adult stem cells have been used in numerous ways to fund to to try to alleviate human disease. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And these opponents of his writing in science argued that many of the examples that he has put forward were simply flawed. And I think as Dr. Prentice and many of his collaborators have pointed out, this simply isn't true. There are numerous studies using adult stem cells, not only here in the United States, but throughout the world, to try to address a whole variety of human illness. And, and the irony, of course, is that these critics fail to mention that there is not a single, not a single study ongoing anywhere on the planet to try to use embryonic stem cells in a clinical setting. So they were criticizing those of us who would, would basically uh, promote adult stem cell research without mentioning the fact that embryonic stem cell research with regards to clinical ap applications has really gotten nowhere. And they're going to say, well, it's only been around for less than 10 years, embryonic, whereas adults have been around for 30 or 40 years. Well, that's misleading in the sense that human embryonic stem cells have been around for only 10 years. But mouse embryonic stem cells, which basically is the foundation for embryonic stem cell biology has been around for a lot longer than that. Mm -hmm. And so, and there's been a lot of interest in that as well. So it's not really fair to claim that the work with embryonic, the human embryonic stem cells is, is, is so new that we know nothing. A lot of what we know comes from work from, embryo, from mouse embryonic stem cells. And it's clear that though there are differences, b both of these different stem cells from the different species do behave in a, in a similar manner. Now, let me ask you, I know that they were bandying about the word treatment versus cure. And I guess with adult stem cells, there are supposedly 72 treatments that have now been verified or something to that nature well, I think, when I was I think reading. The, the best way, yes. But no technical cures. Uh, is that correct or what? Well, I think, I think the... What, what, we what have does to, that mean to the people that, in the general that's public? That's true. Um, I think it's more accurate to say that there are 72 or so studies, mm -hmm. clinical studies at different levels of sophistication that are being undertaken throughout the world to try to take advantage of the possibilities, the potential of adult stem cells to treat different uh, human diseases. There are no cures per se in that many of these studies are still ongoing. So we've not really got to the point where we can say with some def de def uh, definitive conviction that yes, we've we finally found a cure, but these 72 different avenues that address different issues are all very exciting possibilities that will hopefully one day lead to cures for some of them. And what about the, uh, I've read articles that they're finding that adult stem cells have more plasticity or flexibility, I guess. For, well, I think. What, what, what is that all about? Well, w the, the, the advantage of embryonic stem cells is that they have the capacity to become most, if not all, of the tissues associated with the adult uh, human being. What we are now seeing is that many stem cells found in adults might have a similar plasticity and that they are, you can take them in the laboratory and transform one type, say a bone marrow cell, into a different, a radically different cell type like a nerve or a kidney cell or a muscle cell. And so though the repertoire of possibilities may not be as wide as embryonic stem cells. First of all, there are so many different kinds of adult stem cells that it's not unlikely that we would be able to identify different adult stem cell types that will be able to, in some way, provide the cell type of choice that would be needed for regenerative medicine in the future. I see. Well, it's quite interesting. Now, what is the story with uh, embryonic? They have. Um Teratomas, or what's the word? Yes, you see, I mean, one of the, it's interesting because one of the things that is hardly mentioned in the, um, in, the in the political debate is that one of the tests for embryonic stem cells is that if you take an embryonic stem cell and you place it into an adult mouse, it will go on and to produce a teratoma, a, a, a cancer, a tumor. You, this is not found with adult stem cells. Adult stem cells are relatively well behaved, and so they don't go off and become tumors when you put them into human beings. Now, I have heard arguments uh, by those who, pro who proponents of embryonic stem cells claiming that we eventually will get to the point 
where we'll, we will be able to control embryonic stem cells in such a way that, we will, that they will not produce tumors. But I think, to be honest, today, at this point in time, we still do have a risk of, say, curing Parkinson's. The, if, if they want to say that we can cure Parkinson's, we might be able to cure Parkinson's, but then give someone a brain tumor. Uh-huh, I see. Well, I'd like to move on now because uh, th it's uh, this whole area for the general public is perhaps uh, um, a bit fuzzy and all that sort of thing, but it's fast moving also. And what we have is uh, uh, an article that appeared just in the last week in a, a journal called Nature. Nature. Can you tell us, um, and, and it was, had to do with people from Worcester, Massachusetts uh, and advanced cell technology. Can you tell us what that was all about? and? what kind of claim they were making regarding the embryo. So um, this paper was published in Nature, again, one of the most prestigious science journals in the world. It came out last Thursday. And uh, the Lanza group working at Advanced Cell Technologies in Worcester claimed that they had been able to take individual cells from a human embryo and produce stem cell lines from that individual cell without destroying that human embryo using a technique called prenatal genetic diagnosis. Uh, as things have become clearer over the last week, that claim seems to have been a little bit stretched, a little bit far-fetched, because if you read the paper, the group had 16 human embryos to begin with. Mm -hmm. They ended up isolating 91 different cells from the, these 16 embryos. So they did not isolate a single cell from these embryos as the media, the mainstream media had claimed. And now it appears that in fact every single one of these embryos was destroyed in the process of isolating these cells. Mm. Second, the frequency, the efficiency of this process is relatively low. They were only able to get two stem cell lines from the 91 individual cells from the 16 embryos that they, that they did experiments with, suggesting that it's a little bit, uh, that it's hard for us to claim that at this point that this technique can be used to isolate stem cells from every single embryo without destroying that embryo. I think it, it, it's, it's to, be, to be honest, the efficiency is, is, too, is too low, it's too inefficient for that. Since well, then, too, there's been uh, an additional cri criticism that we live in a society which will only, that which allows experiments to be done on human beings only if that human being gives consent or in some way directly benefits that human being. Mm -hmm. And as different commentators have pointed out over the past week, taking individual cells from embryonic human beings, one places their own life at risk because it's not quite sure if we damage them by removing that single cell, or if in fact affecting their long-term health over the course of their life, and that we're doing this without their consent, and also without any direct benefit to them, given that these stem cells will be used for research that do not have a direct feedback, direct benefit to the embryo from which the original cell was derived. So that would be in direct contradiction to what medicine really is all about, That's isn't true. it? You know, I mean, medicine is supposed to help the individual. Right, and at this point, we would simply be using the individual to make biomedical progress. Yes, this progress might inevitably, in the long run, over the next hundred years, lead to cures of some sort, but this, again, is to take advantage of, of this very small embryonic human being who himself will not benefit from this research. Right, and so of the 16, are you saying if I multiply by five or six, say six, there were only six cells for each embryo? Well, on uh, average? On average, I understand what, if you, if you take a look at the paper, uh, table one of the, um, of the figure, mm -hmm. basically they were taking, on average, six cells from each embryo. I see, very interesting. Well, um, there's so much to uh, discuss. Uh, is there anything else that uh, perhaps that I didn't uh, broach that you would like to mention about uh, the, the state of where we're at today? in embryonic stem cell research? Well, I'd just like to point out there was a very exciting development over the past month or so. There was a paper published in the journal Cell, which shows that, w that there was a group in Japan that is now able to take the cheek cell of a mouse 
and convert that cheek cell into an embryonic stem cell without making an embryo. This is called nuclear reprogramming. We've identified the four genes that are important for this process, and it is my hope and my, my dream that in the next year or so, the next few years, we'll be able to advance this technology so we can simply take a skin cell of a patient and convert it directly into an embryonic stem cell without making or creating or destroying human embryos. Wow, that's very exciting. That's really quite something. Well, um, thank you very much, Father Nick. Uh, if you have any um, questions or would like to get in contact with uh, Father Nikanor Ostriaco, uh, you can try him on his email, which is um, naustria at providence.edu. Can we get that up on the screen? There it is. <laughs> well, in closing, we hope uh, you learned a lot t today about uh, uh, embryonic stem cell research and where it's been, both politically, legislatively, but more importantly, biologically and morally uh, in our society. And the hope that uh, Father Nick just mentioned at the tail end of the show, that it will provide goodness in the future. Uh, and if you'd like to get in contact with us, uh, MCFL, uh, we're in your community, and you can start by contacting perhaps our headquarters in Charlestown, which is 617-242-4199, or visit our website, masscitizensforlife.org. And also, this TV show is going to have its own new website, which is lifematterstv.org. So uh, go check it out, uh, log on, and um, we're growing the website. Uh, it's rudimentary now, but uh, soon it will be chock full of interesting information. Finally, we hope you'll inform others about our show, Life Matters. We are confident that if people know the truth, they will ultimately change their hearts and minds to pure love and kindness for the unborn, the sick and the infirm, the elderly, and all humanity. Thanks for watching. I'm Brendan O'Connell, your friend for life. Thank you.